Hello, my name is Dylan McCartney, and I am with George Mason's Gunston Hall. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all to a special program today. Uh, on June 12th, 1776, the Fifth Virginia Convention adopted the Virginia Declaration of Rights. It was largely written by George Mason. Uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights codified many of the ideals of the American Revolution. It influenced the important American documents that came after it including the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. Uh, the ideas that George Mason expressed have continued to be examined, expanded, given new form in the centuries since in documents like the Declaration of, of Rights of Man in 1789 or the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And today, to help us to commemorate and understand the events that took place 224 years ago, it is my pleasure to introduce our esteemed guest. Stephen D. Solomon is the Marjorie Dean Professor of Journalism at New York University. His latest book, Revolutionary Dissent, How the Founding Generation Created the Freedom of Speech, explores the raucous political protest of the nation's founding period, uh, how that gave meaning to our freedoms of speech and press at a time when it was a crime to criticize public officials. Uh, it was named a legal book of the year by the law blog, Concurring Opinions. Steve is now at work on a new book that will tell the story of the birth of the America, America's Bill of Rights. Uh, he, uh, he teaches First Amendment law and is the founding editor of NYU's website, firstamendmentwatch.org, which provides news, commentary, uh, and legal and historical background in today's many conflicts over freedom of expression. An earlier book, uh, Ellery's Protest, How One Young Man Defied Tradition and Sparked the Battle Over School Prayer, explores the controversial religious freedom case, Abington School District versus Shemp. In 1963, the Supreme Court ruled that prayer and the Bible reading exercises required in schools in Pennsylvania and many other states that were, uh, violated the First Amendment. Steve is a graduate of Pennsylvania State University and received his JD from Georgetown University Law Center. So thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Steve. Looking forward to your talk. Yeah. Dylan, thanks very much, and, and thanks to everybody at Gunston Hall for inviting me to share Declaration Day with all of you. Um, I should uh, start uh, by saying that um, you know, what, the, what work you do at Gunston Hall is so important, uh, not only to the scholars, but really to, to everybody um, who wants to know about, uh, wants to understand better uh, what happened in the founding period, uh, the accomplishments of the founding generation, and of course, uh, also uh, to understand their failings and, and contradictions as, as well. Um, the ideas expressed in the, in the Declaration of Rights are important. Um, some of the words uh, recognizing, recognizing natural rights were uh, expressed by Jefferson a month later in the Declaration of Independence. Um, and the Virginia Declaration became a model uh, for state bills of rights that uh, emerged over uh, the next year. You know, in America, and also became, of course, the model for the Bill of Rights in 1789. So um, these ideas that were first expressed in, in 1776 and you know, put in the form of a declaration are so important uh, to uh, the subsequent history of protecting rights in America. What I want to do um, in the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes, uh, followed by some, some questions, um, is to look at, at one specific right um, that George Mason and uh, delegates in, in Virginia protected. And that's um, the right to um, uh, publish freely without um, interference by the government, so freedom of the press. And um, I, I hope that um, through uh, a little bit of historical um, uh, understanding here, we can, we can see how these principles apply today as well to the many conflicts that uh, revolve around uh, freedom of the press and uh, how it, um, uh, the, the, the problems that it causes uh, with, with political figures and, and, and so forth. So um, with that, I think I will uh, share my screen here. And there we go. So, George Mason um, and his bulwark of liberty, we'll get to that phrase in, in just a minute. Um, uh, 
Actually, this, uh, for some reason, this is not working well. Okay. Can everybody see that? I'm sorry. Um, Okay, so uh, this is a Virginia Declaration of Rights in George Mason's hand, and you can see Declaration of Rights made by the representatives of the good people of Virginia. And it goes on for, for four pages uh, in, in hands. And um, then we get to, to section 12. And here it gets interesting in terms of protecting freedom of the press. Section 12 conveys two ideas. Um, if you compare it with our current First Amendment, um, the, first, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech and the press. And so that's a very strong statement of what Congress can't do. This is um, very different. Here's two phrases, and uh, the second phrase says that liberty of press can never be restrained but by despotic governments. Stephen, so, Stephen if, I, if I can interrupt for just a sec, we can't yeah. see the screen at the moment. Okay. Sorry. Um, sorry about that. Just the perils of uh, technology. Yeah. Um, can you see it now? Uh, no, we cannot. Okay, so let me go back. I'm sorry about this. Can you see that? Yes, we can see that, yes. Okay, very good. Sorry about that. Um, so now I'm going to screen share. And here's, here's where we are. Can you see that? Yes, and I think you Great. need to use the buttons that are in the Zoom call to move between slides. Okay. Um, okay, so. Uh, so the, the, the two phrases, so the, so the second one I was, I was talking about can never be restrained but by despotic governments, the implication being that if you're not a despotic government, you're going to protect the press. And of course, they would see themselves as a liberal government protecting individual rights and liberties. But the, it's the first phrase that's, that's, I think, more interesting because it starts out by, by explaining why they want to protect the press. Freedom of the press is one of the great bulwarks of liberty. And that's the reason why they want to protect it. They're not protecting it solely to protect printers and writers, although that's important. But they're also doing it because by protecting the press, it has an effect on other rights. It's a bulwark of liberty. It goes beyond the press itself and beyond the writers. That is, the writings the political writings have an effect on society that goes beyond the writers themselves. And so it's a great bulwark of liberty in general. So this is, a, this is a, um, something that is very important uh, to the founding generation. And bulwarks of liberty goes back at least far, as far back as 1721 in the writings of, of Cato, uh, an anonymous pamphleteer, actually two English uh, newspaper men uh, in London at, the, at that time, and it's picked up here by by George Mason. But if we go ahead to, um, no, can you see, you saw you see the new slide? Just to make sure. Good. Okay. So we go ahead to 1800, about a quarter of a century later, and we see James Madison, the author of the First Amendment, and he's writing in response to the Sedition Act of 1798, which is probably the most odious anti-speech and anti-press law in American history. And it was passed in 1798, just seven years after the First Amendment was ratified. And it's interesting that Madison expresses the same idea. And he says that the, the, you know, the, that the function of the press and the reason why we protect it is the right of freely examining public characters and measures. So public characters are public officials 
measures are the things that public officials do, the, the, the laws they propose and the policies and so forth. So the right of freely examining those things and then the free communication among the people thereon. So it's not just press criticism, but it's also the free communication among people. It's kind of a, the idea of the press as a platform uh, to convey a marketplace of ideas, free communication. And then here's, here's where it gets back to, to George Mason. So all of this has ever been justly deemed the only effectual guardian of every other right. And so, again, the idea, Madison, Mason, and the other founders, that uh, you protect the press, not just for the benefit of the writers and the printers, but because what they do is uh, larger in scope. They, their function is to protect liberties um, beyond freedom of the press. If one was to, you know, to, to suppress the press, then it would affect other liberties as well because we won't be able to discuss what public officials were doing. And so that, that's a fundamental principle uh, of, of the First Amendment. And you see it being played out right here uh, with George Mason and, and James Madison. Um, then I want to go uh, to, to, to yet another founder uh, in 1815, and we'll see you know, why it was that um, they, they felt this way about the press. And I would suggest that uh, they felt this way about the press for, for, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one uh, was that the press at the time, and, and you have to go back to the 18th century now, you don't, there, there aren't many platforms of mass communication like we have today, but back in the 18th century, um, it was the press, the printers, that were the vehicle of mass communication. They carried news throughout the colonies, um, and from the presses came all the revolutionary publications, the newspapers, the pamphlets, the broadsides, um, the printing of, of resolutions passed by colonial assemblies, uh, prints of uh, political art and uh, engravings, such as uh, uh, Paul Revere's famous engraving of the Boston Massacre. And so uh, these, all these things came off the presses, and uh, that was the means of distributing it throughout the colonies. So, so it, was, it was that important. And also because it was so important, the second reason why it was uh, um, you know, protected by the founding generation and thought of as, as being worthy of protection is that it was, it was the, the target of suppression by British authorities using laws of seditious libel to try to punish printers. And that's, that's what we'll, we'll get to uh, uh, now. So, so a Adams uh, in 1815, he's in retirement. Thomas Jefferson is in retirement. They're writing to each other and uh, a lot of letters uh, published separately as a, as a book that you can pick up if you're interested. And at one point, Jefferson asked Adams, what do we mean by the revolution? So these are two old founders uh, recollecting what those years um, meant to them. What, what, what did it mean in retrospect? And so Jefferson asks, what do we mean by the revolution? And Adams says, surprisingly, perhaps, the war, that was no part of the revolution. It was only an effect and consequence of it. So wow, all that bloodshed is not the revolution itself in the eyes, eyes of, uh, of, of John Adams. So um, what was the revolution? Well, the revolution, he says, was in the minds of the people before a drop of blood was drawn at Lexington. Why does he say that? Well, because they went in a very short period of time from being loyal subjects of the king to being revolutionaries. And that was a change of public opinion that was so profound that it was a revolution in itself. And so in his, in his eyes, the revolution really occurred uh, before any bloodshed took place. And then, he, and then Adam says, if you want to find out how public opinion changed, you have to look at the records of 13 legislatures. So all those things were, were published by printers, by the press. They appeared in newspapers and proclamations. The pamphlets that came off presses, the newspapers in all the colonies, these ought to be consulted to ascertain the steps by which the public opinion 
was enlightened and informed concerning the, concerning the authority of parliament over the colonies. And that was the central issue of the revolution, the authority of parliament over the colonies. And it was the press that carried those debates, those discussions, uh, printed the pro proclamations, uh, and, and all those things uh, that got the, the public opinion moving in the direction of separation. Okay, so let's, let's go back and see uh, what was going on with the press. And uh, I mentioned prosecutions by British authorities. Uh, and this is part of what the, the founding generation was thinking about. If you go back to the 13th century, Parliament passed the law, the first seditious libel law. And, and this a seditious libel is a crime of criticizing the government or government officials. So if you criticize the government, if you criticize the king, parliament, you could be thrown in jail for doing so. And parliament passed a law, any slanderous news or false news? Ah, false news, fake news, false news, maybe interchangeable, but here you see a reference to false news back in the 13th century. And that was outlawed, it was punishable because it caused discord between the king and his people or other great men of the realm. Now, why would they pass such a law? It's because, uh, for one thing, I mean, sovereignty at that time was with the king and parliament. They had all the power and people were subjects of the king. Of course, in America, it's the, it's the opposite. Sovereignty is in the people. And the people who hold public office are there by uh, because we voted them in and we can vote them out. But this is, this is an attempt by Parliament in the 13th century to criminalize, criminalize criticism of government. It's important to, to, to see that initially what they punished was false news. Not, not truth, but falsity. Okay, so false news or tales. That changes though. Uh, for those of you who are just joining us a little late, I wanted to let you know that you are able to ask questions on Facebook, uh, and we will be taking questions at the end of our program. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, thank you. So in 1606, a, an English court called the Star Chamber changed the law, and they said that not only false statements would be punishable, but also truthful defamation of government. And the truthful defamation of government was actually more dangerous. That, that, that's kind of odd, isn't it? But there's a certain logic to that. If you criticize the king or parliament and what you say is false, they have an opportunity to rebut the falsehood and make things right. But if you've caught them doing something wrong, you're publishing the truth, what are they going to do? So in a way, if you're concerned about protecting the institutions of the crown and parliament, then um, actually truth is more dangerous. Truth is more dangerous. And so truth actually from that point on exacerbated the libel, exacerbated the libel, made the libel worse. Okay, and then uh, an English justice, a famous justice named Holt, 1704. Um, this is the basic stance that they took at that point. Um, if speakers are not punished for possessing the people with an ill opinion of the government, no government can subsist. For it is very necessary for all governments that the people should have a good opinion of it. So they, they're kind of requiring people to have a good opinion of the government or punishing them for it. After all, if you don't derive your power from democratic consent, then you really need the, the I, I guess, the good opinion of the people. Um, otherwise, there might be a revolution to throw you out. There's no democratic legitimacy. So seditious libel is punishment after publication, um, and uh, or or what 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 people would say um, uh, to each other or or in speeches. The arrival of the printing press in 1500 enabled dissent to spread, um, very much different than people just talking over the backyard fence or giving a speech in the public square, because now people could 
write their dissent down in documents and very quickly publish large numbers of copies and, and, and spread it throughout the realm. And uh, so they instituted a form of censorship, pre-publication censorship and licensing to make sure that uh, seditious publications would never see the light of day. And so this pre-publication censorship system, today it's known as prior restraints. Some of you may recognize that word, prior restraints. Um, and so with, with these laws, think about the system they set up. Pre-publication censorship and post-publication punishment. So they had um, a very strong um, control over speech. Uh, controlling it before it could take place. And if things got through that were critical of, of uh, the king or parliament, they could uh, clamp down at that point. But the licensing system expired in 1694 because the pressure, the commercial pressure for, uh, to develop the printing industry uh, with newspapers and all kinds of publication and advertisements that would uh, help commerce generally uh, put too much pressure on parliament um, and they had to allow, um, you know, uh, newspapers to, to start and to publish without censorship in order to uh, promote uh, the commercial development of England. So <clears throat> they let the licensing system expire. And that led this gentleman, uh, Blackstone, uh, famous in English law for compiling commentaries on the laws of England, he defined liberty of the press as essential to the nature of a free state <clears throat> but it consists in laying no previous restraints on publications, not in freedom from censure after publication. So you're allowed to publish, but you could be prosecuted for criticizing the government with what you pu published. And um, that defined freedom of the press in England. Freedom to publish, but punishment afterwards if you criticize the government or public officials. And of course, this is the system that was uh, inherited by the colonies. They, they inherited English law, and there are 1,200 seditious libel prosecutions in the colonies before 1700. These were uh, prosecutions of, of spoken words because uh, you didn't have any presses in the colonies until the late uh, 1600s. Um, but this is, these were serious matters. Here's a, 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 from the colonial court records. Uh, this fellow, John Wheeler, um, said that the officials uh, in New London County sit here to pick men's pockets. Well, I, I suppose a lot of people today would say that of tax collectors. Um, we don't go to jail for it and we're not fined, but he was because what he said was seditious libel. Edward Everly, he called the legislature well, I'm not going to repeat that. Um, you can read that for yourself. Uh, but he got 39 lashes on his bare back for saying this. Um, this would be protected today, of course. Um, in fact, I, I suspect that if Edward, Edward Everly were, were alive today, he'd make a, a kind of easy transition to Twitter uh, with, with things like this. So, um, uh, but back then, 39 lashes. It gets worse. Richard Barnes. Based on detracting speeches about the governor of Virginia, that earns him two broken arms, a gauntlet of men beating with rifles, and then, just in case he hadn't learned the lesson, they pierced his tongue. I guess that would be a deterrent, wouldn't it, to speaking out against the government. So this is, this is in, the, in the 17th century, late 17th century. Now there's pushback get into the 18th century and there's pushback against seditious libel. And it comes in the context of an increasing um, uh, unhappiness that the, uh, the colonists have against uh, the rule by, by England. And here's 17, six, uh, 1735, John Peter Zenger is, is kind of a, a famous figure among journalists because he was a martyr to freedom of the press here in America. And uh, he was brought to trial because he published a newspaper that, that criticized the royal governor of New York. Uh, he was arrested and put up for trial. And um, remember that, that truth was not a defense. And his lawyer, um, I mean, basically it was a lost case because he had criticized 
the royal governor, and that was seditious libel, and there was really no defense of truth in the law. But his lawyer went before the jury, and in his closing arguments, he, he said to the jury, you know, how can you punish truth? You know yourselves how, what a terrible man that the, the royal governor is. You, you talk about it all the time among yourselves. You know that my client has published the truth. How can you punish him for merely saying what you yourselves believe? Well, that argument won the day, and the jury, nullif in, a, in an act of nullification, refused to follow the law and exonerated, acquitted John Peter Zenger. So this was a, the first pushback in the colonies against seditious libel laws. So then you go forward about, about 30 years and you got this, the Stamp Act, and that's when all the trouble started. So the Stamp Act was an act of parliament to try to recover uh, some of the expenses of carrying on colonial administration in the colonies and the wars that were being fought on the frontier. And they imposed a tax largely on uh, paper. And so any paper that was used for newspapers and court documents and so forth had to carry a stamp. It was very expensive. It would double the cost of the newspaper. They made a strategic mistake here, the, the parliament, um, because by imposing a tax on newspapers, they were infuriating the very people who controlled uh, mass communication in the colonies. That's, that's probably the one group of people you wouldn't want to inflame, but they did that. And it caused uh, a lot of misery for royal administration. So what were they going to do? How would they protest? Uh, they couldn't circulate their views with all of these things that we take for granted. Obviously not. But they did have the press. And now we get back to our story of the importance of the press um, to the founding fathers. And uh, one of the first things that came off the press to object to the, to the British rule and the Stamp Act were um, a series of pamphlets, many pamphlets. Uh, one of the more famous ones by James Otis Jr., The Rights of the British Colonies Asserted and Proved. Very controversial at the time, the asserting the rights of, of, of the colonists to tax themselves and not be subject to taxes without representation in uh, Parliament. And you had the newspapers, you know, that off the presses came not only pamphlets, but, but newspapers. Uh, the Boston Gazette was the most radical newspaper in the colonies, um, and it was for about 10 years, subject of seditious libel prosecutions themselves. Uh, here's a, an excerpt from the Boston Gazette, 1765. And this is, keep in mind, this is directed at the Prime Minister of Britain. To make us all slaves, now you've lost, sir, the hope. You've, you've but to go hang yourself, we'll find you the rope. This is all seditious stuff, and it's being published in America by the Boston Gazette and other papers. And they went after their own as well. I remember uh, James Otis Jr., so he wrote another pamphlet, and some of the patriots didn't like what he wrote, so they went after him. And they look at this poem that they wrote about James Otis Jr., one of their own, not a British uh, royal governor, not uh, a, a, a royal official, but one of their own. And uh, look at these words that they use to describe uh, their own um, patriot who they think had gone down the wrong path. Then there's uh, Ebenezer McIntosh, a figure from the founding period that uh, almost nobody knows today. But why is he significant? Well, everything that I mentioned before, the pamphlets, right, the, the newspapers, the, uh, all the, write, the political writings, um, could appeal certainly to the educated class the politicians, the lawyers, the merchants uh, who had some education, they could not only read, but they could understand the arguments that were being made, many of which went back uh, in English law. But they also realized that they were going to, uh, the patriots were going to win the battle uh, with parliament over the Stamp Act. They had to show a united front. It couldn't just be the educated classes against parliament. They had to spread protest. And so they reached out to a shoemaker named Ebenezer McIntosh. And McIntosh was a leader in Boston of, uh, shall we call them blue collar workers, people who in the trades, uh, ship workers and so forth. Um, he was recognized as a leader in Boston of, 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 those, uh, of those men. And so he would be able to bring those men out to 
an assembly and a, pro and a, and a protest. He knew everybody. And so they decided to uh, hang um, the British prime minister and the stamp collector in effigy from the biggest tree in Boston. And that was located, this is, this is Boston, and uh, you wouldn't recognize it if you know Boston today. This is Back Bay, Boston, water then. All this became filled land, same, same thing here. But at the time, uh, it, this is Boston, uh, there's another half of Boston up to the north here. But on market day, uh, they, people came across this narrow causeway with water on both sides, and they went up, uh, Orange Street, and they, in order to get to the center of town, they had to pass uh, Orange Street, Newbury Street, and, and this area in here, and this is where the Liberty Tree was. And so they came in that morning, and what they saw was hanging from the biggest tree in town, effigies of the British Prime Minister, and the devil, and the stamp collector. And, you know, to hang the devil with, with the British Prime Minister was about the worst thing the most vitriolic, most mean-spirited thing you could possibly say in colonial Boston. Why? Because the devil was the incarnation of all evil in Puritan theology. And so to hang the devil with the British prime minister uh, was an act of sedition uh, that was uh, uh, rarely seen. Anyway, so, so these people came and they stopped. People from downtown came and uh, they, had, uh, it, it, they had half the, the, the people in Boston at the Liberty Tree. And so you see how they could spread protest. Here's another newspaper in Boston and they describe um, the spirit of patriotism at the Liberty Tree. Scarce any could attend to the task of day labor, but all seemed on the wing for freedom. Everybody was out there, dissent and protest. Assembly for the purposes of protesting the British was, was uh, uh, taking over Boston. Okay, so then, um, you know, the, where's the press come in? Well, the press ran accounts of this, and those accounts were carried um, virally, shall we say, um, on horseback. They would take copies of newspapers, and uh, they would drop them off uh, up and down the coast, drop them off at other newspaper uh, printers' offices, and the, the articles would be printed in, in other newspapers. And then what you saw was uh, copycat. Liberty trees all over America. And so that original form of protest that started in, 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 uh, in Boston to enlarge the public sphere with the common man spread all over America. And that spread protests uh, in a really profound way. By horseback, delivering newspapers. And you can see here's a print from an engraving in New Hampshire, the stamp master in effigy. So back to John, John Adams in 1765, his observation, our presses have groaned, our pulpits have thundered, our legislatures have resolved, our towns have voted, the crown officers have everywhere trembled, and all their little tools and creatures have been afraid to speak and ashamed to be seen. So there you see the, the early recognition of the role of the printers, the role of the presses in um, the a burgeoning uh, protest movement against Britain. Um, you have John Dickinson, uh, probably the most famous pamphleteer until Thomas Paine, uh, with his letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania, very influential, started as, as, as a newspaper series. Uh, John Dickinson, in addition to writing pamphlets for the well-educated, also wrote the Liberty Song, which was published um, all over America, and people went to taverns, they went to the Liberty Trees in cities and towns, and they, they were singing this song. And you might recognize these words. This is where they originated. United we stand, divided we fall. Originated with John Dickinson, a well-educated lawyer who also happened to be a best-selling songwriter, so to speak, in, in the colonies as well. Alexander McDougall became a martyr to liberty in New York. In fact, uh, those of you who are familiar with, with uh, New York around um, where, where I work at NYU, Washington Square, there's a street called McDougal Street that runs from Washington Square Park south um, for I don't know how many blocks, but it's named McDougal Street after Alexander McDougal. 
McDougal, uh, so another form of protest off the presses were what were called broadsides. And uh, newspapers might be four to six pages once a week. Broadsides could be published much more quickly. Quickly meant in a day or two because they had a set type and print it one sheet at a time. Uh, but he wrote a broadside um, against the, uh, the royal governor of New York and the colonial assembly for something that they did. He was arrested and put on, uh, almost put on trial for seditious libel, but was ultimately freed as a martyr to liberty before, uh, before the, the actual trial. And McDougal was a wealthy merchant and the lieutenant governor observed he's a person of some fortune and could easily have found the bail required of him, but he chose to go to jail and lies there imitating Mr. Wilkes in everything he can. Mr. Wilkes is a reference to John Wilkes, a martyr to freedom of the press in England. And um, so uh, one thing you don't want to do if you're a public official, you don't want to make martyrs out of speakers. You don't want to make martyrs out of writers uh, because they've become to re represent freedom. And that was the case with Wilkes. It was the case with McDougal and a number of others like uh, John Peter Zenger, who I mentioned earlier. It just amplifies their message to make martyrs out of them. And that was the whole idea of McDougal refusing to pay bail, even though he could afford it, and choosing instead to sit in a cold jail cell in New York in the middle of the winter. That's how dedicated he was to the cause. So just to break in really quickly, uh, yeah. those of you who are watching, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in on Facebook, and we'll have some time at the end uh, to, to give you some answers. Great. So, so the Boston Gazette attacked Governor Bernard, the royal governor of Massachusetts. His cruelty to a loyal people, look at obstinate perseverance in the path of malice, diabolical thirst for mischief. Well, he didn't like that, so he tried three times to get indictments against the Boston Gazette and failed each time, because by that time, the colonial juries simply would not indict or convict for seditious libel. Everybody was protesting. So they just ignored seditious libel laws in their protests. They ignored it when they were asked to indict or convict their neighbors when they were brought to trial. And here's an example of it. Um, so uh, the royal governor went to the Massachusetts House asking for um, them to do something about the Boston Gazette. And instead, the Boston Assembly passed this resolution. And there you see it, 1768, eight years before George Mason writes it. So they stand up for the liberty of the press. Then you get Paul Revere, 1770, uh, with his very famous uh, engraving. And everything about this engraving is wrong. That's not the way it happened. You see the British Captain Preston with his sword upraised. You see British troops lined up, executing, massacring the civilians, and that's not the way it occurred. Actually, what happened was they were pelting them with coal. This was in March, coal, ice, ice pieces of ice, uh, snowballs, and so forth, and one thing led to another. A shot was fired. This was all documented in the trial that followed, but with a, a uh, with newspapers only publishing once a week, there was the opportunity for a rabble rouser like Paul Revere to take the narrative. And that's what he did with this image that showed the British actually executing, massacring civilians. And this filled the void of information and became the narrative of British oppression throughout the colonies. He made an engraving, the engraving was printed all over America. And so you can see how protest was spreading uh, through the presses. Then you get to the Virginia Declaration of Rights, 1776. We, we talked about bulwarks of liberty. I hope you can see the way the press played such a substantial part in um, moving protests forward and uh, protecting other rights that they would by 1776, call it a bulwark of liberty. So here's George Mason at the Constitutional Convention. He's one of the delegates from Virginia. Um, he participates, he pretty much goes along with 
the, the construction of a, a strong central government and starts to have second thoughts at the end, thinking maybe that strong central government that was being created was too strong and might violate, um, come to violate uh, the people's rights. So he said, we really need a Bill of Rights. And uh, the convention did not agree with him and he refused to sign the constitution saying that his, he had a number of objections, but the top of his list was no Bill of Rights. It didn't have a Bill of Rights. Then the constitution goes out for ratification. Some of us might think that, you know, from our, today's perspective, the constitution is, is such a sacred document that it was, must have been easily ratified, but it wasn't. The main, there were a lot of issues uh, separating the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, but uh, probably the, the most important one was the, the fact that the Constitution had no Bill of Rights, and Mason and others made that case. The first uh, number of states that had the ratified conventions ratified pretty easily, then it starts getting into trouble. Look, if you're going to have a, a new country, you better get Pennsylvania. You better get Massachusetts, you better get Virginia, and you better get New York. Otherwise, uh, it's probably not going to work. Those are the wealthiest, most populous, most influential states. You better get at least three, or three out of four of them, but you, better, you probably should get all four. Massachusetts, look how close it was. They proposed amendments, the first of the state ratifying conventions. They're uneasy with the Constitution without protections for individual rights and liberties. South, you need nine to ratify. This is a, by a two to one vote, by proposed amendments. New Hampshire puts it over the top, only by 10 votes. And when I say proposed amendments, these are compromises. This is where the, the, the Federalists finally say, in order to get enough votes, okay, we'll consider amendments in the first federal Congress if you guys agree to ratify. And that wins enough votes to get a majority. Virginia, probably the most interesting of the ratifying convention, conventions, it's George Mason and, and Patrick Henry opposing the Constitution, James Madison taking the lead in supporting the Constitution. Madison finally at the end, along with his, his friends, agreed to proposed amendments and they squeaked by 89 to 79. They go to New York. New York was heavily anti-federalist in her convention. By that time, the Constitution had been, had been ratified for those states that had approved it. Anybody who didn't approve it would be outside the Union would, and would have to be a separate country or find an alliance to join. New York, with that in mind, thinking that they, how could they possibly survive as an independent country, even with that, only 30 to 27 ratifying with amendments. North Carolina rejected, um, and then these are the last to ratify. North Carolina comes back later. So the Virginia Ratifying Convention suggests a declaration of rights, a Bill of Rights, for the first federal Congress, and uh, Henry and Mason, in opposition to the Constitution, uh, propose uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press be added as amendments to the Constitution. As why? Well, it's the great bulwarks of liberty. They're thinking about the role of the press in the revolution and the, uh, the fact that it was the subject of prosecutions and needed to be protected. James Madison goes to the first federal Congress. He proposes an amendment, well, a series of amendments, one of which protects freedom of speech and freedom of the press. This doesn't look like the, the First Amendment that actually came from committee. It got amended a number of times and rewritten. So this is, this is what came out and ratified in 1791. The words will be familiar. Just 45 words, and it's worth looking for just a minute at how they set it up. These are not just rights that they just threw into an amendment. Uh, without regard to kind of how they fit or what they said. This is what James Madison and the founders saw as the protection of uh, self-governance, uh, popular sovereignty, a democratic process. 
look at the first rights protected, respecting, make no law respecting the establishment of a religion or prohibited free exercise thereof. They're protecting the rights of conscience. The rights of conscience involve the most innermost thoughts that a human being can have. Thoughts about where, you know, how you relate to the universe, how you might relate to uh, a superior being if you believe uh, in a superior being. These are, are thoughts that go to the very essence of, of who you are and they're thoughts, right? They're, they're thoughts. Um, then it, it expands outside of your inner thoughts because people uh, take their inner thoughts and they express themselves in speech. And that's what we're doing right here. We're, or at least I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm delivering a, a talk, I'm engaging in speech, but people, uh, you know, all over, you know, uh, talk to friends, talk to in the public square, they're exchanging ideas. So that's the next right protected. Next, the press. Why is the press next? Because once you've exchanged ideas among a small number of people, you may want an institutional means of spreading those ideas to a large audience. And so you can see sort of step by step where we're going here. Ideas, distribution to a large audience, mass means of communication. Once you've done that, you've spread the ideas, you get to the right to peacefully assemble. That is, once you've spread the ideas, you seek people of like mind. And you get together with those people and you go to the streets perhaps and, and, and protest. I think we've seen that in the last couple of weeks, haven't we? Where you know, mass protests, um, those people are assembling to make their ideas and their, uh, their thoughts um, uh, visible to, to many, many people. They're assembling and that's protected. For what purpose, ultimately? Petition the government for a redress of grievances. And again, if you look back at the events of the last couple of weeks, the, the people assembling in the streets is now we're getting to the point where proposals are coming forward for reform of police departments and, and, and so forth. So what you have here is a, an exercise of democracy in 45 words. It's all laid out in, in linear fashion. Um, so this is the, these are founding principles. The, 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 there's a fragile nature to all of this because it is kind of linear and um, it, uh, if you interrupt these freedoms at any point, it could affect everything afterwards. So if you look, for example, at the press, the attacks on the press, uh, enemies of people and uh, all of that, um, if you hinder the press, uh, if you punish the press, then you may very well affect the rights that come afterwards. If you assemble in the street, but you break up peaceful protests, it not only affects this right, but can affect that right. So uh, it's, this is very powerful, but also at the same time, somewhat fragile. Uh, and every part of the process needs to be protected. I think that's what the, George Mason and the fa other founders would say. So James Madison recognized that the press was checkered with abuses. Checkered as it is with abuses, the world's indebted for all the triumphs which have been gained by reason and humanity over error and oppression. Very strong statement. Again, in 1800, in uh, answer to the Sedition Act. And then in 1964, the New York Times uh, versus Sullivan case uh, gives the Supreme Court an opportunity to enunciate the central meaning of the First Amendment. This is probably the most important single case in First Amendment law regarding freedom of the press. And they talk about a profound national commitment that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, may well include vehement, caustic, unpleasantly sharp attacks. Look at those words that the Supreme Court uses, very much against the idea of seditious libel. In fact, they strike down a seditious libel law. And what they're saying is, you can be very energetic in criticizing the government, uninhibited, robust, wide open. And uh, uh, I'd be happy to take your questions. This is uh, First Amendment Watch in New York University that, that Dylan mentioned. We cover uh, the current conflicts. We've been talking about the distant past, but uh, this is how conflicts play out today uh, in every possible way, uh, involving public officials and assembly in the street.
and so forth. So uh, I'd be happy to, um, to take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Solomon. We appreciate uh, that, that presentation and overview of uh, freedom of the press as it impacted the colonial period. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into Facebook and we will relay them here. There is a bit of a lag, just be aware. Uh, but we already have some great questions, so why don't we dive right in. Um, how did the evolving thought of, in the colonies about issues like uh, slander and libel uh, differ from what people were thinking in Great Britain, or did it differ? Well, it, it differed quite a bit because um, they were in, in the colonies um, because they were engaged in protest. They saw the value of protest, and they they were essentially, um, even though there were seditious libel laws, they were refusing to follow them. And there was some of that in England as well with martyrs like John Wilkes. But all the protests in the colonies were violations of seditious libel laws. I mean, that was pretty clear. Uh, by the definition of what seditious libel was. So while the law remained on the books in the colonies, it was ignored. The popular understanding of freedom of speech was very different than what uh, was on the law books. Their experience was, we're allowed to criticize. That's what we do. We're allowed to go into the streets peacefully. We're allowed to petition and um, um, be very strong in our criticism. And that, so that, that's an evolving idea about freedom of, of speech and freedom of the press that was uh, diverting from what was the case in, in England. Uh, do you have any good historical examples uh, of how to protect and defend a free press today? I think the, the First Amendment provides really all we need. Um, you know, those, we, we looked at the 45 words, only 14 of those actually have to do with the press. Remember we talked, you know, there's establishment of religion and free exercise of religion and some other things. In terms of the, the press itself, the words are only, there's only 14 words. So it doesn't give us a lot of instructions about what those words mean. And that's up to the Supreme Court. And you know, in the second half of the, the 20th century, up to today, the Supreme Court has taken an increasingly protective um, stance on freedom of the press and, and freedom of, of speech. Um, there are exceptions to protection of speech. I mean, things like uh, incitement to violence. Now, you may see that at a demonstration where certain um, certain characters in the in in, the, in a protest might start trashing a, a store or something. That's that's obviously not protected speech. In, incitement to violence, threats are not protected by the First Amendment or harassment. Um, so there there are some categories of speech that are not protected, but uh, they're pretty much walled off. And political speech that we're really talking about mostly today is. Um, um, you know, gets the highest level of First Amendment protection. The, the court does not want to, um, you know, put, you know, strict boundaries about what people can say. Maybe about what they can do, because that's conduct. We're talking about speech. And remember, this, the Supreme Court said in 1964, New York Times versus Sullivan, they're protecting even the most vitriolic speech, wide open, uninhibited, robust speech. Some of that can be nasty, and it is. You know, you, you, you look at what the discourse that goes on, especially on social media, it can be nasty, and that's protected speech, unless, again, it goes into an area that one might define as harassment of an individual, threats against an individual, incitements to, to violence, and, and things like that. So it's very extensive protection with those exceptions in mind. You mentioned during your talk that uh, there was a kind of a proliferation of newspapers and pamphlets uh, in the colonies. Um, were there more pamphlets? Did they have a greater circulation than papers? How many people were even reading these, these tracts? Oh, there were, there were hundreds of pamphlets. Um, I mean, I can go back. I, I don't have the numbers with me, but they were very popular. And there were pamphlets written um, in, 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 in some kind of sequential order. Someone would write something and then someone would put out a pamphlet to answer that one and then it would just kind of go down the line. 
as, as kind of a debate in, in, in pamphlets because pamphlets were a very special way of um, you know, expressing your views. It gave you the opportunity to, to, to write and think in depth. And so that was where, you know, in the pamphlets, a lot of the, um, a lot of the writers, especially those who had, you know, well-educated, could make their case by going back into English constitutional history. They could, you know, discuss the, you know, Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights of 1689, and, and uh, they, could, they could show how the way they were treated and they were still English subjects, show how they were treated was in violation of, of the English Constitution as expressed in Magna Carta and, and the English Bill of Rights and, um, and, and make that case very strongly. So what was the audience for them? The, you know, the educated, more educated classes. And that's why people like Alexander McDougall were so important because most people um, uh, were not, well educated enough to read and understand the, the pamphlets and so you had to bring out masses of people and liberty trees liberty poles effigies of the prime minister things like that that's the kind of almost political theater in the streets that would attract a mass audience and and show parliament that this was not just uh, objections that were coming from uh you know politicians and and, 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 and lawyers in America, this was a, a popular protest against uh, oppression. So, so the pamphlets were, were one part of it, but uh, I don't think you'd have the same result um, of uh, Parliament rescinding the Stamp Act if it were only pamphlets being circulated about it. It was a mass protest. Uh, you mentioned uh, about the sort of the transfer, the the horses, you know, riding the news out into the countryside and all that. Were there regional variations? How did you know um, in in how the news was spread, or, or was news more likely to be contained in the region and only occasionally spill out into the broader colonies? Well, you know, the, the deeper uh, the colonies got into protests, the the more reason there was to get that news out, and so. Uh, th there were no copyright laws at that time, which is important. So newspapers that were dropped off at another printer, um, they could take articles from, you know, like in Philadelphia and, and reprint exactly what had been in the Boston Gazette. So these, these, these radical uh, articles and, and letters to the editor and um, the, the, uh, there were no journalists, there were no reporters out at that point. There were, there were no such thing as reporters. Uh, these newspapers, they had, um, generally, they had partisans writing the accounts of what happened to the Liberty Trees. So um, these accounts would be spread throughout the colonies. And of course, the, the more important the, the development, the faster it would spread and the wider it would spread. And, but that said, you know, it would take um, maybe three weeks for, for uh, an article published in the Boston Gazette to show up in Charleston, South Carolina, because it just, just took a while. And plus the newspapers were generally once a week. Um, sometimes they, they, they travel by ship down the coast, but often by horseback. So, um, and if the news went to London, that was like five or six weeks, and then five or six weeks back, that was communication back then. It's, it's hard to imagine in, in our age, um, where it's, it's literally, you know, second by second, but um, the viral spread of news occurred then, but you just have to get your mind around the idea that viral spread of news uh, could mean a, a week or a couple weeks, uh, but that's the way it spread and people read what was going in, Bo in Boston and they were not reading it. They were not reading accounts by independent, nonpartisan journalists as at least the professional press tries to do today. These are partisan accounts that they were reading. They were reading the letters that were partisan. And, um, and so that's how the idea spread. Uh, got a bit of a different question for you. What's the best nom de plume you've seen from this period? Oh, there were so many of them. A lot of, a lot of them went back to, uh, they, they took names from Roman times or Greek times. They, they almost competed for the best names. What name would convey the most trust? You know, a friend of liberty, 
a son of liberty. Alexander McDougall, um, you know, had a good one, son of liberty. And of course, there were sons of liberty, right, the, in the organization. But, you know, they would take names of, you know, Cato and um, just people who are well admired back then, uh, people who espoused Republican values. And so you sort of took on the mantle of, of their credibility. And, um, you know, one, one of the interesting things was there were, there were people uh, who took on multiple pseudonyms. So, so Samuel Adams, I think, had, I don't know, something like 20 or 25 pseudonyms. And some of them, uh, crafty as they were, uh, these people, they, um, they would write um, in the same controversy under multiple pseudonyms. And they would make it sound like there were a lot of people writing and supporting their views when it was actually the same person just taking different names. So, um, so why did they use pseudonyms? Because of seditious libel laws. Even um, the, uh, when, when, the, um, when the family generation wrote articles uh, criticizing seditious libel and supporting a free press, they would take a pseudonym because criticizing seditious libel was itself seditious libel. So they had to protect themselves. Now, Alexander McDougall, with that broadside, he signed it a son of liberty. How did they, how did they find him? How did they you know, arrest him? It's because the, the royal governor of New York uh, offered a very large reward for his identification, very large. And so uh, a, a printer's apprentice in the shop where that broadside was printed came forward and claimed the reward by saying, I got your man. It's Alexander McDougall, and so they went and they arrested him. So they could find out sometimes, but um, that's often why they, um, the, the royal authorities ended up prosecuting printers rather than the writers. John Peter Zanger was a printer. He printed a newspaper in, in, in New York with all kinds of stuff that criticized uh, what was going on in the royal governor, but they, they couldn't figure out who who those, uh, they couldn't pierce the pseudonyms. So the only alternative was to go after the printer himself. And hence, John Peter Zenger was dragged into court and had to defend a seditious libel trial. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Solomon, for joining us. Uh, we certainly appreciated it. We were very happy that you were able to join us. We're very happy this technology exists that allows us to do this. Um, it certainly beats the alternative. It, uh, it, it, it does, and it gives an opportunity for people all over the country and perhaps all over the world to, to, to see this either now or later. And um, too bad that can't do it at Gunston Hall, but uh, I'm sure that'll happen in the future. But um, thank you for hosting this. Um, a lot of fun for me, and I hope it was of some um, help to, to everybody. Certainly so was. Um, for those of you who are watching, uh, if you like this content, uh, be sure to check out our uh, and follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, to check out our website, sign up for our emails. We have a lot of great events, digital and physical, once we reopen, uh, that we'll be doing. Um, there will be more or more posts and stuff related to Declaration Day uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, and this video will, will go online and can be watched uh, at your leisure. And so if you enjoyed it, feel free to share it with your, your friends and your family. Um, but from all of us here at Gunston Hall, thank you for joining us, and we will see you again in the future.